Welcome to the Italian Cultural Institute in London. I'm Katia Pizzi, the director of the Institute, and on behalf of myself and the Institute staff, it is my greatest pleasure to host the London leg of the Dante in the World Tour. Paraphrasing Thomas Carlyle, we can say that Dante truly is the common property of all nations. Dante's cultural influence in the English-speaking world is immense, stretching as far back as Geoffrey Chaucer and John Milton and sweeping across the Romantics, Keats, Shelley and Blake. In the 19th century, the Victorians and the Pre-Raphaelites, particularly in the person of Gabriel Rossetti Sr., stimulated a Dante Renaissance whose long wave reached the modern poets from W.B. Yeats to T.S. Eliot and beyond. The Divina Commedia is, in the words of Ian Thompson, a veritable journey without end. And you will hear Ian Thompson's commentary in a short while. The fortune of Dante's work in English emerges no more vividly than in Canto V of the Inferno, a collection of the best known and best loved verses of all times in any language. If you haven't fallen in love reading about the passion of Paolo for Francesca and Francesca for Paolo, you surely are about to fall in love listening to these eternally incandescent verses interpreted by a truly great actress and performer, Greta Scacchi. So I descended from the first into the tighter second circle. Here, less space, but greater pain, so louder screams ensue. Minus the terrible, with grinning face, squats on the threshold. Here he tries the crime and girds himself according to each case. For when it is another wretch's time to come before him, he confesses all, and then this judge performs a legal mime. Allocating him a place in hell, he coils his tail as many times around himself as grades that soul is doomed to fall. Continually they come within his bound. Each criminal in rota is arraigned. They tell, they hear, they're somersaulted down. O oh, you who come to the abode of pain, cried Minus as he fixed his eye on me, abandoning the rule of his domain. Mind how you enter, mind with whom you be, let not the wideness of the gate deceive. Then said my guide, what means this ignorant plea? Do not impede him who is fated to achieve, for what is willed is what is in our grasp to will to be. So now we'll take our leave. With that, the doleful notes began to rasp my consciousness. I've come into a zone where pain is expressed by shriek and moan and gasp, where not the feeblest ray of light is known, which squalls and bellows like an ocean tempest when the waves are driven by the cyclone. This infernal, never-ending blast drives every soul before it in its sweep tormenting them with every turn and twist, who, confronted by the ruin, weep and gnash their teeth and moan and curse and swear and blaspheme God and bawl and howl and shriek. And then I learned such torments are incurred by those who like to practice carnal sin when reason is by furtive lust ensnared. As starlings, when the evening draws in, assemble in tremendous seething flocks, so are those dark souls gathered by the wind and hurtled to and fro in random flecks, devoid of hope of rest or rest from pain to which they are eternally transfixed. 
And as the cranes go honking by in trails across the sky, so did those shadows travel, uttering the loneliest of wails, which made me cry, who are those wretched people, master, whom the black air flails and lashes till their very being seems unraveled? The first of these who were enslaved by passion he replied, was empress of a thousand tongues, for she was queen of Babylon. So gross was she, to lechery so hardened, she established lust as civil law, and hence was free to do what should be banned. Her name is Semiramis, bawdy widow of King Ninus. As the books relate, she ruled the lands ruled by the Sultan now. Then comes one whose passion was so great, she slew herself. That's Dido. Cleopatra's next, who had a corresponding fate. See Helena, for whose sake the wars rolled on for years, and see Achilles bold, who fought with love and lost unto its laws. See Paris, Tristan, and a thousand other souls he showed me, pointing, giving out the names of those who died for love in days of old. When he had finished allocating blame to all those ancient dames and cavaliers, a rush of pity caused me to exclaim, I fain would to that twosome speak, who steer so lightly by the starless wind, they seem a ghostly gondola and gondolier. He answered, wait until the swirling stream has brought them closer, then entreat them by that love which leads them, and they'll not retreat. Then, as the current whirled the spirits high above our heads, I raised my voice and cried, oh, come and speak. Speak to us, if none deny. As doves with wings extended paraglide the air, when summoned by desire, they swoop into their nest like loving groom and bride. So did these spirits veer from Dido's troop and flutter towards us through the air malign, answering my pity with their truth. O oh, living creature, gracious and benign, who travels through the void to visit us, whose bloody limbs on earth were intertwined. Were he our friend who rules the universe, we'd pray to him to grant you all his peace, since you have pity on our fate perverse. Now you may hear and speak of what you please, and we will hear and speak with you a while, since now the howling of the wind has ceased. The town where I was born is Maritime, where the mighty Po, his journey run with his attendant streams, is reconciled. Love, which is so catching, seized this one for that fair body which they robbed me of. It still disturbs me how the deed was done. Love begets love. I was seized by love for him in turn, which gave me such delight that as you see, we still are hand in glove. Love brought us one death. He who took our life will be consigned to the abode of Cain. These were the words, she said, which I now write. And when I heard those wounded souls complain, I bowed my face and held it low until the poet spoke and asked me, what pertains? And I replied, alas, what kind of thrill what longing led them to the sorry pass? And when did they their vital souls imperil? 
So I turned again to them and asked, Francesca, all your torments make me weep with grief and pity, whether now or past. But tell me, did you wake or did you sleep? And did you sigh when love breathed in your ear of secret joys so dubious and deep? And she, there is no greater pain, I fear, than to recall past joy and present hell. And this is known by your overseer. But since you want so desperately to dwell on how and when our passion was begot, then I'll be one of those who weep and tell. One day, to pass the time, we read of Lancelot, who loved illicitly, just the two of us. We had no thought of what as yet was not. From time to time, that reading urged our eyes to meet and made our faces flush and pale. But one point in the story changed our lives. For when we read of how the longed-for smile was kissed by such a noble knight, the one for who eternity is by my side, all trembling, kissed my trembling mouth. The man who wrote this was a galeotto, so was the book. That day, the rest of it remained unscanned. And while one half of this fond pair so spoke, the other wept so much, I fainted. All of me was overwhelmed by that stroke of pity, and I fell as a dead body falls. Dante's Inferno remains the most widely translated book after the Bible, with at least 50 English language versions in the 20th century alone. To most contemporary readers, the Inferno is Dante, with the other two books of the Divine Comedy, Purgatory and Paradise, seen as a distinct falling off. The French writer Victor Hugo went so far as to claim that the human eye was not made to look at the heavenly light of Dante's paradise. When the poem becomes happy, it becomes boring, he reckoned. For Victor Hugo, as for many readers after him, the Inferno was the really interesting book, where a recognisable human drama of guilty love, transgression and punishment is depicted. The siren call of damnation seems to call to us in a way that Dante's emotional rescue and atonement do not. In the cult American television series Mad Men, Pointedly, the charming adulterer Don Draper is seen reading a copy of the Inferno while on a hot Hawaii beach. English translations of the Inferno tell us much about changing attitudes to Dante down the ages. The Victorians were prone to reduce the crystalline poetry of Canto V to a pious sort of verse full of righteous morality. Canto V of the Inferno is where Dante and his guide Virgil descend to that part of hell reserved for those who have been overcome by lust. Dante watches aghast as Minos, the judge of the underworld in classical Greek mythology, wraps his monstrous tail around himself to determine the number of the circle of hell where each of the sinners is to be sent. There was a message in Canto V, which solemn-minded Christians such as the art critic John Ruskin, saw as their duty to convey. The wages of lustful desire shall be known in hell. Recast as Christian hymnology, Canto V was celebrated in Bible classes across Britain. Civil servants, bankers, politicians and barristers, even Queen Victoria's Chancellor of the Exchequer, William Gladstone, all tried their hand at translating the canto. Among the damned souls of Canto V are Semiramis, the Queen of Babylon, 
Helen of Troy, Cleopatra, and the Trojan prince Paris, who stole Helen from Greece. Swept up by erotic passion in life, in hell they are endlessly buffeted about in an infernal windstorm. Dante recognises Francesca da Rimini, who had fallen in love with her husband's younger brother, Paolo. As Paolo and Francesca approach Dante through the gloom, he is moved to pity. The lovers writhe without hope in a sort of black whirlpool. As carnal sinners, peccatori carnali, Paolo and Francesca were of considerable prurient interest to English translators. In the Romantic period, the first great English translation of all three books of the Divine Comedy was by the Reverend Henry Francis Carey. Carey's translation was praised by the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge in a lecture he gave on Dante in 1818 at the Philosophical Society of London. In the Carey translation, Dante's poem was a proto-romantic epic of endless subtle beauties and endless sorrows, Coleridge judged. Carey's burial place in Westminster Abbey is under a stone marked the translator of Dante. The emphatic definite article, the translator of Dante, is deserved. Carey's still is a superlative Dante. The romantic poet and medical doctor John Keats first read Canto V in the Carey translation, which he took with him on a walking tour of the Lake District and Scotland in 1818. To his brother George, Keats had written that it was well worth the while to learn Italian in order to read the original, which he tried to do, presumably using Carey as his guide. Most of the English Romantic poets, in fact, came to Dante through Carey. Carey's translation saw a surge of interest in touring Italy for its art and classical antiquity. In Italy, Keats himself hoped to find an intoxicating self-forgetfulness and a hoped-for balm to the tuberculosis that would kill him eventually. Gracious and courtly, Francesca speaks to Dante for just a few minutes. She explains how her love had been her undoing. Her first dangerous kiss with Paolo was exchanged while they sat together one day reading the Arthurian romance of Lancelot's passion for Queen Guinevere. Paolo and Francesca should not have been so overwhelmed by the literature of courtly love, Dante seems to be saying. Paolo, who is not named in Canto V, speaks no word to Dante, but weeps throughout. Dante is overwhelmed and bewildered. Is love then a sin, as punishable as lust? On hearing Francesca's story, Dante faints and drops as a dead body falls. E cadi come corpo morto cade. I swooned as if by death I had been smote and fell down even as a dead body falls. That's how Lord Byron translated the famous line in 1820. Why Canto V so appealed to the Romantic poets and became a part of early 19th century British Dante mania is not hard to understand. Before swooning to the ground, Dante allows Francesca one of the greatest lines in all literature. Nessun maggiore dolore che ricordarsi del tempo felice nella miseria. There is no greater pain, I fear, than to recall past joy in present hell. A line that's reiterated incidentally by a gondolier in Rossini's opera Othello. Intriguingly, the protagonists of Dante's story of doomed extramarital love were well known in medieval Florence. Married to a physically deformed older man named Gianciotto Malatesta, Francesca could not resist kissing the handsome Paolo Malatesta, her husband Gianciotto's sibling. He and Francesca continued their illicit affair for ten years until it was discovered by Francesca's husband and, so the story goes, 
he ran the young lovers both through with his sword. It was love that overcame Francesca then, and love that brought her to a violent death with Paolo. Rodin's sculpture, The Kiss, was intended to represent the Tuscan lovers in their unwitnessed ecstasy. Their love for each other strikes the modern reader as more than merely carnal, though. Dante compares Paolo and Francesca to a pair of doves returning to their nest. They radiate an air of spiritual grace. According to Giovanni Boccaccio, the author of the Decameron and Dante's first biographer, a servant had told Gianciotto what was happening in his household. Paolo tried but failed to escape through a trapdoor. Incensed, Gianciotto drew his sword from his wife's breast and plunged it into Paolo, killing him too. Canto V is not just a story of sin in relation to desire, but of a sin that undermines the patrician order of medieval Italy. It involves adultery, as well as near incest, the lovers are brother and sister-in-law, and murder. Keats, who wrote so hauntingly of life's uncertainty and of his own consumptive state, dreamed one night that he was in Francesca da Rimini's alluring presence. The dream was one of the most delightful enjoyments I ever had in my life, Keats wrote to his brother George and sister-in-law Georgina in 1819. Locked in a shuddering, drawn-out kiss with Francesca, Keats floats like a ghost in the dream's whirling atmosphere. On waking, Keats resolved to describe the dream in a sonnet. The erotic charge is unmistakable. Pale were the sweet lips I saw, pale were the lips I kissed, and fair the form I floated with about that melancholy storm. Keats's interest in Canto V was less scholarly than enthusiastic, no doubt, but it attested to Dante's growing popular readership in England in the Romantic heyday. In 1816, Keats's poet friend Lee Hunt published his own version of Canto V in his long epic poem, The Story of Rimini, where Francesca and Paolo are transformed into romantic archetypes of doomed love. Lee Hunt amplifies the 60 or so lines in Dante to an impressive 1,706 lines. Mere narrative hints in Canto V become full-blown episodes. The poem opens in medieval Ravenna one morning in the spring of 1275. Crowds are gathered among them the knightly Tuscan poet friend of Dante's, Guido Cavalcanti. After the marriage vows between Francesca and Gianciotto, like peaches on a tree, Paolo and Francesca are seen pressed together in an illicit embrace. By the time Lee Hunt published his own translation of Canto V in 1846, the greatest poet physician in the English language, John Keats had been dead for a quarter of a century. In time, the darkness and despair manifest in Canto V attenuated into something less bleak for British tastes. Thomas Love Peacock's satirical novella, Headlong Hall, published in 1816, in the same year as Lee Hunt's The Story of Rimini, as an eccentric Coleridge-like intellectual called Mr. Cornelius Chromatic perform an after-dinner Dante entertainment. With the help of his two daughters, he regales Squire Harry Headlong and his assembled dinner guests with an unwittingly dire imitation of Dante. The imitation, intended to capture the romance of sunset, merely suggests pretension and outpurples anything by even Dante's most indifferent translators. Thomas Love Peacock's novella is an indication of how Dante had become almost a parlour entertainment in England by the time Keats died 
of tuberculosis in Rome in 1821. Between 1825 and 1914, there were more than 20 musical operas based on the Paolo and Francesca story, many of them comic, but some of them melodramas in a dark spirit of Byronism, black secrecy, and extramarital sex. In the early 1970s, the Italian director, Franco Zeffirelli, asked Dustin Hoffman to star as Dante in a short film version of The Inferno. The film was never made owing to a lack of funds. It was clear that Zeffirelli had seen the silent movie of The Inferno, directed by a trio of Italian directors in 1911. The film took over three years to make and was the first true blockbuster. In the United States alone, it made $2 million, about $45 million in today's money. At one point in the film, Dante, recognisable from his medieval hat and flowing gown, contemplates the spectacle of Francesca as she hovers before him, accompanied by the wailing Paolo. Draped in white robes, the lovers seem to be bathed in a supernatural radiance. 700 years after Dante's death, Canto V of the Inferno continues to disconcert and enthrall. Thank you very much, Ian, for a very pertinent, very compelling and very eloquent presentation. Thank you. What do you think is the relevance of Dante today and Canto Quinto in particular? Well, I think the first thing that needs to be said about Dante is that we don't need to um, fear damnation or to be moved by the beauty of the Christian revelation. I mean, we might be. But I think the reason a lot of us respond to Dante today is because he wrote the story of an ordinary individual, an everyman, who sets out, hopefully, in this world in search of renewal. So the book is a kind of pilgrimage a turning to a better way of conducting our lives. And I think this strikes a chord with lots of people today who are perhaps feeling adrift in the world we live in now. Dante somehow reaches out a hand there, um, guiding us through the three zones of the afterlife, the inferno, purgatory and paradise, into a better life. And I think that that's the story of us all. We all want this. Obviously, we hear these uh, compelling, amazing verses, uh, and we hear of the love of Paolo for Francesca and Francesca for Paolo. How does this love differ from the love of Dante for Beatrice? Scholars would probably say that we don't actually know whether Beatrice de Portinari, Beatrice, really existed, but we do know that she was the sort of love of Dante's life. Um, and if we are to believe Dante, um, he met Beatrice in... Florence when he was nine and she was about eight. And when she died at the age of 24, Dante was completely bereft. But by the time that Beatrice died, um, Dante had been married for seven years to Gemma, Gemma Donati. So it must have been, I think, very galling, very upsetting for Gemma to see her husband moping and whining and being very lachrymose for this woman who wasn't his wife. So in a weird and very strange way, Dante became a widower of a woman he wasn't married to. So I think that um, one of the reasons he is so disturbed by Paolo and Francesca and their story of adultery in Canto V of the Inferno is because Dante probably at some level thought that he'd come close to, in Christian medieval terms, damnation himself mm. through this love affair, if you like, this extramarital love affair with Beatrice. And it may be, of course, why Dante uh, swoons, faints, collapses in the canto, because he's so overwhelmed by the danger of this love affair. Can you tell us something about English language translations of uh, La Commedia, and particularly this one by Kieran Carson, yes. which is so wonderful? Yes, Kieran Carson's uh, translation, which came out in the early 2000s, I think is one of the greatest translations of Dante we have now. Kieran Carson, who sadly died not so long ago, was a poet himself and understood very well that the way to translate Dante was not to give some sort of very fusty, dry, academic kind of interpretation of the Italian, but to re-inject 
the language of Dante with its vigour and its rough edges. And so we have a translation here which um, has Americanisms in it, it has some um, vulgar slang, it has some fairly kind of punchy swear words in it, and it has great beauty too, uh, just as the original does. The first mention of Dante in English literature probably comes with Geoffrey Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer mentions the absolutely horrific story from the Inferno of Count Ugolino. Count Ugolino uh, was shut up in a prison with his two sons and two grandsons and the key to the dungeon was thrown away and they died of starvation. Um, and this became very much a kind of obsession with English translators, this story, um, before the Romantic period and Chaucer mentions it in the Canterbury Tales. But I think with the Romantic period, it's Paolo and Francesca's story that takes over from the Ugolino story. And then if we go forward in time, we have the um, translations for the Penguin Modern uh, Classics by Dorothy L. Sayers, um, which I think went up to 1962, her work on the three books of the Divine Comedy. And then Robin Kirkpatrick's more recent Penguin translation, um, and so on, up to the present day and beyond into the 22nd century, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Mi piace salutarvi, ritornando al punto dal quale siamo partiti. Abbiamo detto che Dante appartiene alla lingua, alla letteratura e alla cultura italiane. Nel contempo, Dante appartiene alla letteratura europea e alla cultura di lingua inglese, moderna e premoderna. Il suo genio trascende il tempo e lo spazio. Non sappiamo immaginare un futuro senza Dante e la sua commedia. Dall'Istituto Italiano di Cultura di Londra, un saluto cordiale e caloroso a tutti. Felice anniversario dantesco!